Well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker for tonight, Sandy Masuo. She's um, spoken quite often for the Hort Society. She's a really popular speaker around LA. And uh, she's also an inveterate plant nerd, her own words, currently serves as senior writer in the communications department at the Huntington Library Art Museum and Botanical Gardens. Prior to that, she worked at the Los Angeles Zoo in the publications division for 18 years. Um, and she quite often helped us host events at the zoo while she was there. Uh, and from 2010 to 2014, Sandy also uh, served on the board of Southern California Horticultural Society. And last but not least, she has published a novel under uh, the pseudonym Rosanna Dumas. It's a horticultural detective novel. And uh, I did not realize that until I read her bio today. And so I think I'm going to have to pick that one up. <laughs> Anyways, tonight, Sandy's going to be talking um, about uh, different aspects of publications from the Huntington. So Sandy, are you there? I am indeed. Thank you so much. All righty. Shall I hit the screen sharing? Alexis, are you there? Yes. Go ahead and screen share that. All righty then. Um, is there any way to get rid of this bar at the top or is that just par for the course? Yeah, that's just gonna, that's just there. Okay. Um, so, um, I'm subtitling this talk, uh, this botanical life, because I was asked to give a talk at the second Thursday garden talks at the Huntington, which I've done a couple of times in the past as well. And, um, they always sort of give me vague directions. And this one was, Oh, talk about whatever you feel like talking about. And so I had just, uh, for the past year, I've been at the Huntington for just over two years and I've spent a lot of time researching really interesting plants and really interesting books. And I was, uh, sort of stumped for how to organize all my thoughts. And then I was, you know, brushing my teeth, listening to a podcast of this American life, which is one of my favorite, uh, radio shows. And it, Ding! All of a sudden it appeared to me. Um, basically, uh, so I call it this botanical life because I basically organized this into three acts. And those of you who uh those of you who watch or listen to um this American life will probably recognize the format. So um during the pandemic, I was uh still in my previous job and I was working on this really long, really inscru, you know, just uh, impenetrable editorial project. And as we all were, I was sort of sequestered at home and I got into a habit of working on the editorial project until I felt like my brain was melting. And then I would take a little break and go outside and, you know, putter in the garden for five minutes. And it's actually really amazing how much you can get done in five minutes, you know, a little weeding here, a little weeding there. I'm going to move this plant over here. You know, you can even repot something really quickly. And so one day I was, you know, sort of juggling the impenetrable editorial project and these little outbursts of, of gardening. And it occurred to me that basically gardening and editing are really kind of the same thing. It's just that you're working with plants in one setting and you're working with words in the other, because, you know, when you, when you decide, oh, you know, that bladder pod's kind of getting out of control. I think I need to trim it back. It's like, you know, editing an article where someone has spent just a little bit too much time on a tangent and you need to sort of rein that in. And so this started this whole kind of thought process of thinking of a garden as a kind of narrative. And every garden really is a reflection of the gardener. And every garden really does tell a story when you really look at it. Um, and so I kind of did a little deep dive into history because I started uh, thinking about the history of gardens and gardens are really human beings sort of trying to create their own pocket of nature, like to, to play mother nature and create an area that um, produces whatever it is that they desire, whether it's something that's aesthetically pleasing or something that's pleasing to the palate. So when you, when you dive back into history, um, this is a lovely fresco of a garden uh, in Egypt from about 1380 before the Common Era. And, you know, when you look at it, you, you and, you know, when you start looking at garden structures, you start to see there's a kind of grammar, you know, there's like this water feature in the middle, and it looks like it's got birds and fish and, and, you know, there are all these trees are I, I apologize for my screaming cat. He's kind of deaf and singing his the song of his people. Um, uh, and the plants are arranged in this sort of 
you know, aesthetically pleasing way. There are clearly date palms and some fruits. And then in the upper uh, right hand corner, there's a person who seems to be harvesting or weighing or something. Um, and so, uh, you know, you can see that this has been sort of a, a composed pocket of nature. And as you move forward in human history and move forward in gardens, um, they kind of evolve. And, and again, sort of following the garden as narrative um, idea, it, back in the beginning, before there was written language, people passed on stories sort of as part of oral tradition. Um, and so I don't think that until there was written language, you know, and, and even fairly after a while after there was written language where there really genres, you know, I don't think that, um, you know, people were sitting around in the time of Gilgamesh saying, I need an adventure um, story. There were just stories. And uh, I think that gardens kind of work the same way. You know, it, it, when you look back at these very old gardens, you know, they sort of had a, a food function. Like in this one, you can see there's also a water feature, although it looks like it's probably a functional, like these look like they're irrigation channels. And then there are different types of trees that are kind of arranged. And there's a, a little structure, just like there was a structure in the previous one. And there's a person, although the person is not, uh, apparently not gathering fruit, possibly just, you know, contemplating um, maybe which plants he wants to take out or why didn't I weed out here more thoroughly. Um, but, you know, these, these features kind of, um, evolve over time, just as um, stories have kind of evolved over time and become more sophisticated as we developed written language. So when you move forward a few more centuries, we're here with the gardens of Lucullus in Rome, not the gardens of Locutus of Borg, for you Star Trek nerds out there. Um, and in this garden, you can see that it's now it's walled in. So it's 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 very highly structured. Um, if you look closely, there's a tiny fountain. So the water feature has sort of moved from being maybe a functional water feature to being sort of a decorative water feature. Um, and then, you know, in the interior portion of this garden, everything is very geometric. There are little squares and little circles, and it's very carefully arranged. And in a in a particularly aesthetic arrangement. And then when you look outside that central portion of the, I guess it's a villa, um, you see on either side what looks like kind of orchards. And so, you know, there's there's this kind of evolving separation of not church and state, but of, you know, sort of uh, productive gardening uh, for food and, you know, sort of a purely aesthetic garden. And the pictures on the right are actually photos of um, this actual uh, garden, parts of it that have been um, excavated in Rome. So fast forwarding now, we're in the Middle Ages, and again, the walled garden, we've got, um, you know, sort of the, the fancy people living inside this walled edifice, and uh, I don't know if this is some sort of commentary, a lot of times reflections and, and water and mirrors signify vanity um, in story narratives, and so you've got this looks like a little kingly person with a crown or maybe a bad hairdo, um, kind of staring at him or herself in that water with a little, and it looks like it's got a little trickling uh, stream-like uh, aspect of it. And then, you know, flowers, it looks like there's a goat and maybe some birds. So there's this clearly little happy garden area inside that this guy here probably has some secret password that he's trying to use to get in. And then on the right, again, it's roughly the same time period, this sort of medieval garden where it's very clear that the people inside the walls have, you know, they're the lovely maidens who are disporting themselves with the, you know, um, with the decorative plants. And then in the way back, you see people over in the fields um, growing the food. And so, you know, of course, the parallel would be the anarcho-syndicalist commune garden. Thank you, Monty Python. I'm hoping there's some of you are laughing out there. Um, lovely, lovely filth over here that we're farming. Um, but you know, as you, as gardens move forward, now we're, now we're in the era of Louis XIV, and this is Versailles, which takes this sort of ornamental <laughs> gardening to like an, you know, sort of astronomical degree, because these, these gardens, they don't even really look like plants anymore. They look sort of like carpet patterns. And, you know, there are all these little um, triangular shrubs and everything's been it's it's very meticulous and and careful and yet we still have this water feature uh going down the middle it's just a really massive water feature and you can't see the fruit component of this but uh louis the 14th was quite fond of oranges and he actually had thousands of orange trees and his head gardener designed these these particular um, mobile orange boxes because, uh, you know, Versailles was, you know, outside of the comfort zone for most citrus trees. 
trees. And so the trees would be wheeled into these big indoor orangeries for the winter. And um, they would actually even, you know, um, keep fires going to keep them above freezing temperatures in the wintertime. And then they would all be rolled back out um, for the summertime. So you can, you know, you see where I'm going with this is the, like this division um, when as socioeconomic um, divisions become more pronounced in a society, you kind of, it's kind of reflected in, in the stories that you see in gardens. And, you know, then you come fast forward to the 20th century and the 21st century, where I feel like a lot of more naturalistic gardening is popular now because I think that we are all feeling a deficit of nature. And so there's this yearning to return to, you know, actual nature. But since uh, actual nature is always under threat from development and mining and a million other things, you have these like safe zones, like Kirsten Bosch National Botanical Garden in South Africa. And although this is lovely, and I, when I, just looking at this picture makes me feel warm and calm <laughs> because it's got these pleasing shapes and the colors and there are no hard angles and there's a lovely water feature and their pathways. So it's clearly a very managed landscape and there probably is a fence or a boundary somewhere that we can't see. Um, but there's this illusion that it, that the, this managed landscape sort of gently fades into the, the actual um, hills that are mountains that are behind it. And similarly, uh, kind of a similar effect with California Botanic Garden in Claremont, um, where this is a very naturalistic landscape full of California natives, and yet it has this sort of managed uh, pathway and this artfully um, deployed rock. And, you know, I'm sure it was very carefully chosen to create a color palette in these shapes. They probably even coached those clouds to look artistic in the background like that. And then the extremes are now, you know, sort of a, for an ornamental garden, there's this yearning to kind of be more natural and partly maybe because we've created giant monolithic monocultural monstrous um, agricultural <laughs> gardens like this which is a giant monoculture soybean field that's being uh, treated with pesticides um, and it's funny because I think that I think that it this is such a prevalent form of agriculture that it's it's hard to remember that there was a time when sustainable agriculture was really the only way you could practice agriculture. Um, this is an example. This is a picture of uh, Chinampas, which is one of the an example of the floating gardens um, outside Mexico City, which what used to be Tenochtitlan. And uh, at the time that uh, Hernan Cortez uh, destroyed uh, Tenochtitlan and conquered it, um, that city had a population of about 400,000 people, which is a lot of people for, you know, 1519. And yet um, these sort of floating gardens, there, there was a, you know, there was a system for managing waste. There was a system for circulating the water and for producing enough food for all those people. Um, and so again, you know, this is a contemporary picture. So just as I think we're looking kind of backward to find more nature, put more nature in our gardens. I think we're also looking backward to find more sustainable agricultural practices that are less um, destructive and annoying uh, than giant industrial monoculture. And this is just another example, um, Mesopotamia, which, um, so Mesopotamia was the fertile crescent between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. And just the lucky draw of geological, um, uh, geological processes created these two rivers and they would seasonally flood just like the Los Angeles River once did. And they would flood. And then when they receded again, there would be this rich silt that was deposited on the land and it made it really terrific uh, farmland, which is why, you know, agriculture first started to evolve in the Fertile Crescent. Um, and it's interesting when you look at these um, farm fields, that you know, they're not these rigid lines. They seem to be sort of sympathetic with the curves of the landscape, which makes me think that that must have something to do with the way that this water probably flows when it's in flood. And also um, in the, the front portion of it, I don't think that those are, you know, it looks like there are hedgerows. So there are varieties of plants being grown in there. So again, sometimes the old ways were actually pretty, were actually the more sustainable options, although they didn't produce a bazillion tons of food for commercial purposes. And, uh, you know, Mesopotamia was not alone in many parts of the world. Um, there were, you know, these sort of sustainable uh, growing practices that were sort of in sympathetic to uh, land forms and, you know, water cycles.
So when you look at the Huntington, the thing is the Huntington has um, 17 themed gardens and um, all of them pretty much connect to these old garden traditions. And so the Japanese garden and the Chinese garden I think of um, I think of as sort of cultural narratives because they have been designed to replicate a particular type of landscape from particular places, um, and you know the plant selections in these have all been made to create um, to basically be faithful to these styles of gardens in their native. Um, in their native settings, um, but you can't always grow things here that would you know grow there. So um, you know sometimes you have to make substitutions. But really, the plants in these settings sort of serve the narrative. Um, I guess you could say these are these are plot driven stories where the plot the plot rules. Um, and um, the Huntington also has uh, in the ranch, we have um, an avocado orchard, uh, which is uh, not nearly as old as the citrus. The citrus has been there since before Henry Huntington bought it when it was still the Shorb uh, ranch. And the avocado orchard, although uh, avocados have been in cultivation for thousands of years, um, and the avocado orchard that was at the Huntington was one of the first in California, but the main orchard that we have, which um, has about 33 of those cultivars that Laura mentioned uh, for the December meeting, um, and this was a uh, presentation to talk about the orchards where they had all the different fruit out there, um, but that also is represented in uh, Huntington Gardens. And then, so... This, I mean, people have been cultivating roses since, you know, um, 500 BC. Uh, camellias have been uh, cultivated since, you know, even longer because, you know, I'm maybe I was fascinated to find out that all tea, basically black tea and green tea are both made from camellias. Um, Camellia sinensis, um, but the ornamental camellias have been in cultivation for um, centuries. And to me, these I think of these as gallery gardens because unlike the Japanese or the Chinese garden where you, you know the plot the plot is what rules the landscape, this is really character study. You're studying in close up the characteristics and the character of a particular type of plant that have been you know sort of put out in this lovely, um, very aesthetically pleasing and wonderful smelling. Uh, kind of setting. And this is a kind of a more modern type of, um, you know, sort of display garden. Uh, actually, this is a behind the scenes picture from the greenhouses where the carnivores are, but you know, the bog room and the conservatory is all carnivorous plants from around the world. And um, the desert garden is really, um, you know, sort of a, a testament to uh, arid plants that are adapted to arid climates and uh, carnivores are adapted to uh, nutrient poor habitat. And this is sort of a, a more modern, I think, sort of aesthetic where you're kind of doing a garden that's that's about a biome or about a particular type of habitat. Um, and this again also is sort of a more uh, contemporary version of like a rose garden or the camellias um, because cycads uh, were, have not, were not traditionally cultivated and roses and camellias are very highly manipulated um, genetically to produce ornamental varieties and cycads are cycads. I'm sure there are cultivars and there are a lot of hybrids, but um, these are really essentially, you know, wild plants um, that are on show. And this is, I think, a lovely, the cycad terrace is such a beautiful kind of a gallery of cycads. Which brings us to act two. So if your garden is a narrative that's telling a story, then the plants that you put in it are really the characters that carry that story forward. Um, and it's interesting to me um, as a plant nerd, I love to talk about plants with people because, you know, everybody has that thing they collect or everybody has that one plant that, you know, the, the plant that I sacrificed my car for or, you know, and the way people assign meaning to plants is so interesting to me um, because, you know, plants really don't care. They're, they're just going about their business and it's us, we sort of um, uh, frame them with meaning. And I love this example. Um, when I do this talk in person, I, I like to see a show of hands as to how many people recognize this plant. Um, in its native habitat, it goes by many names. The indigenous people who lived there uh, had lots of different names for it. When it was brought to Europe in the 19th century, it was uh, declared the ugliest plant in creation by Professor F.W. Oliver at University College London. Um, and, you know, uh, okay, I can kind of see that. But I personally um, fell in love with this plant the first time I saw it. And so I'm kind of more in the mindset of 
um, Frederick Joseph Martin Wellwich, who was an Austrian doctor who apparently, oh, I'm blocking myself with this uh, thing I can't really see. Anyway, he was apparently so smitten with this plant that he saw, you know, growing in the Namib desert that he, he fell to the ground and was afraid to look away lest it proved to be a figment of his imagination. And I think that I felt just a little bit of that the first time I ever saw one of these in person, because it is just such a strange and odd plant. Um, and you can imagine, I almost fell over when I was in one of the greenhouses at the Huntington and turned a corner and there were like 15 of them, you know, all in a row, really big ones. And this is a female, it's a dioecious plant. So there are male and female plants. And this one is uh, female, it's making cones. And they were, they were beautiful. They were, to me, they were, you know, because I love the oddities and I'm, I'm in awe of them because they are able to live on fog. They basically, <laughs> they're basically have these extreme adaptations for surviving in the Namib desert where there really isn't much precipitation. There's just condensation from fog that comes in off the coast. And so I had to stop and stare, you know, in a truly well witchy in May way. And, um, you know, they carried that well, which is impression of them is carried forward in their name because Mirabilis means miraculous. And on the right, um, as you may know, the Desert Conservatory at the Huntington has been going uh, undergoing a lot of renovations. And uh, well, which is are notoriously unhappy with being moved and relocated. So all the construction kind of went on around this well, which and its companion plant, the uh, Uncarina that's next to it. But, you know, there are many, many different ways of looking at plants. And so, you know, I, another way, I know that this looks like the beginning of a queen poster, but it's actually uh, Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek on the right, who is the inventor of the microscope. And on the left is Nehemiah Gru, which is one of those amazing 17th century names. I wonder if Nehemiah Gru knew Ichabod Crane. Um, and he, uh, Nehemiah Gru had the distinction of being the first person to closely examined plant tissues using a microscope. So when I read this, I thought, oh, you know, microscope, something something like this that you might've used in high school to look at, you know, uh, sugar crystals or, or something. And, uh, but no, the original microscope was actually, as you can see in the middle of the slide, it's more or less a glorified hand lens. It There was like an objective lens and then a pin. And then and the way you used it was, as you can see in the diagram, you would have to sort of attach your specimen and then hold it up to either a window or a candle to get light to see the features of whatever it is that you were looking at. So when I looked at Nehemiah Grew's book, The Anatomy of Plants with an idea of the philosophical history of plants and several other lectures read before the Royal Society. Um, I, when I looked through this book, I was completely flabbergasted because I, I couldn't imagine the amount of work that he did to look at all these plant tissues because he would have had to work with this hand lens and then draw what he was seeing through this hand lens and then make engravings <laughs> to illustrate this book. And this book um, is actually a compilation of lectures that he gave before the Royal Society. And um, the Royal Society is actually the world's oldest science academy. Um, it was founded in, in 1660 and, um, you know, sort of uh, like an informal academy, like a university without being really a university. And they published, um, you know, Isaac Newton's uh, Principia Mathematica and um, lots of other famous scientist dudes were members and published through them. Um, although sadly, the first woman was not admitted to the Royal Society until 1945. So um, they were all dudes. But um, his, this book is just so lovely. The lectures are, are kind of wonderful. Um, in this introductory epistle that he gives, um, which is to, I think, King Charles II, if I'm not missing my history up. Um, but it, he, he describes... Anyway, it starts off, your majesty will see here that there are those things within a plant little less admirable than within an animal, that a plant, as well as an animal, is composed of several organical parts, some whereof may be called its bowels, which he means vessels, um, that every plant hath vessels of diverse kinds containing di diverse kinds of liquors or fluids, that even plants 
live partly upon air for the reception whereof it hath those parts which are answerable to lungs, so that a plant is, as it were, an animal inquires, as an animal is a plant, or rather several plants, bound up into one volume. Again, that all the said organs, bowels, or other parts are as artificially made, meant artificially meaning um, functionally made, and for their place and number as punctually set together as all the mathematic lines of a flower or a face, that the staple of the stuff is so exquisitely fine that no silkworm is able to draw anything near so small a thread, so that one who walks about with the meanest stick holds a piece of nature's handicraft, which far surpasses the most elaborate woof or needlework in the world. And it goes on to flatter the king because they wanted funding. But um, I just love that passage so much because it was so, he was so clearly um, ardent about trying, you know, talking about the life of plants and all the tissues within them. Um, and these are just a few of the illustrations. Uh, there's some really close up, you know, details of, um, of specific tissues, but then there are also these amazing, lovely anatomical drawings of many different types of flowers. Um, I spent a, a long time in the reading room poring over this because it was really a, a magnificent book. And speaking of magnificent, so before photography became, you know, sort of state of the art for, for capturing images of plants, um, botanical illustration was the standard for documenting plants. And to me, I think of these as like headshots. Um, botanical illustration is almost always, I think it makes the plants look very glamorous and, um, you know, sort of uh, you know, as if they were auditioning for something. Um, and the foremost illustrator of his time was Georg Dionysius Eret, who was a German born illustrator. He was actually trained as a gardener and he ended up working at the Chelsea Physic Garden, which was a um, medicinal garden in London, which still exists by the way. Um, and the director there saw in him some talent. And so he encouraged him to become a botanical illustrator. And so he was really, he was like a rock star illustrator. He not only um, produced a lot of work and both of these are part of the Huntington collections, but he also taught. Um, so, you know, it was very fashionable. I don't know if any of you have seen Amadeus and, you know, here's Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and he's composing these amazing pieces of music. And yet he's also giving music lessons. And that was kind of, you know, the way it was back in the day. And one of his students was Mary Parker. Uh, Countess of Macclesfield. And so last year, the Huntington acquired two albums of botanical illustrations by Mary Parker and her daughter. And they were both students of Ered. And it's amazing because you can kind of see his influence on these uh, images. And they're just, they're so luscious and beautiful. Um, and, you know, at this time, you know, women, of course, couldn't be in professions. You, there was no way, even if you were, you know, a genius, you could not be a botanist and become a member of the Royal Society because women were not allowed. And so botanical illustration was kind of considered this acceptable, um, sort of an acceptable pursuit for genteel ladies and their daughters. Um, if you're interested in this sort of this slightly um, around this time period, Angels and Insects, um, which is based on a novella by A.S. Byatt, kind of uh, covers some of this and, and you know, the tensions of um, aspiring to science and yet being shut out because you're a woman. Um, but these illustrations are really uh, quite beautiful. And then taking it a step, things a step further, Anna Atkins really was one of the very first people in the world to use photography to document botanical specimens. And the photography she was using was not um, what we know today as, you know, sort of uh, stated, you know, the the familiar, the one that we're all familiar with, with the Instamatic cameras or 35 millimeter. Um, these are cyanotypes, which are a type of uh, photographic method where a paper is coated with light sense, light sensitive uh, compound. And it's almost like a herbarium specimen because you actually lay the plant materials on it and then expose it to light. And then it turns into this low lovely blue kind of a um, shadow play of the plants. And the image on the right uh, of the arrowhead plant um, was acquired by the Huntington last year. Uh, and her really, her magnum opus was um, the excitingly titled British Algae Volumes 1 and 2. Um, and yes, I did buy uh, I did buy facsimiles of that. Facsimiles are um, exact reproductions of books. Um, and it, I, I couldn't not buy it, although the Getty actually has um, uh, both volumes in their book collections. 
All right. So we've got narratives. We've got character actors. We've got chorus. We've got a chorus line. We've got all these different plant characters filling our narratives. And then I think um, I realized the other day that uh, my camera roll on my phone has uh, t about 26,000 <laughs> pictures on it. And probably about half of those are pictures of my plants, pictures of plants at the Huntington, pictures of interesting plants that I see in other people's gardens, pictures of plants that I saw in a parking lot. Um, the human impulse to capture the ephemeral has been around since probably humans were humans. Um, you know, going all the way back to Egypt, somebody made that lovely fresco of, of the garden to capture the garden. And um, the Huntington is full of a lot of amazing volumes um, that are that are the end result of people attempting to capture um, their garden as it is in their lifetime, you know, for posterity. Um, so one of the most beautiful, and this is actually a manuscript. So uh, the manuscript, um, you know, there's only one copy of it. And this is actually, these photos are from a reproduction. Uh, Johns Hopkins University Press made an astonishing facsimile of the manuscript published in 1940. So this is uh, known as the Badianus manuscript or the Badiano manuscript uh, because it was translated by Juan Badiano. Um, it was written by Martin de la Cruz. Um, so here's the thing, both Martin de la Cruz and Juan Badiano were actually um, indigenous people. They were Aztec people. Um, and this book was written in 1552. So what happened was uh, the Catholic Church sent a lot of um, representatives to the Americas and they built a, a university in Santa Cruz uh, in Mexico, not the California one. And um, the purpose of that university was to convert indigenous people to Christianity and then educate them in order to become uh, clergy and serve the church. And I tried really, really hard to find Martin de la Cruz and Juan Badiano's Nahuatl names, um, and I could not find them anywhere, which kind of made me sad because I really wanted to know what their um, birth names were. But um, Martin de la Cruz wrote this amazing um, herbal is what it is. And herbals are basically like, um, if you could capture a botanical medicinal garden in a book, that's what an herbal is. It's kind of like a cross between a um, it's like a cross between the Sunset Western Garden book and the Merck manual, if you could merge them together. And so many of these illustrations were so lovely. And I immediately, you can recognize immediately on the left that that is Datura with its spiny seed pods. And on the right is this beautiful um, Opuntia. And so he wrote this book and described the uses, the names and uses of all these plants in um, Aztec, in uh, Nahuatl Aztec culture. And Juan Badiano, who was an indigenous man, absolutely fluent in Latin, translated it all into Latin. And then this book was sent um, back to Spain and it lived in the Spanish National Library. And then over the centuries, it eventually ended up in the Vatican. And it wasn't until the 1990s that Pope John Paul um, returned this book to Mexico, this manuscript to Mexico, and it lives in the National Museum in Mexico City, as it should. Um, that's one of my dreams one day would be able to see this book. Um, but it's it's just delightful, the style of the illustrations to go through the page after page and visit this you know, garden is really a treat. And then, you know, on the other side of the world, um, the Ben Sao Gangmun is, or the Compendium of Materia Medica, was basically, again, sort of a herbal Merck manual that was compiled by Li Shizhen, who um, was a really famous, uh, he's actually kind of a, a pop cultural hero. Um, Jet Li, actually, the action movie star Jet Li, cited uh, Li Shizhen as uh, one of his heroes. Um, and this man spent uh, much of his life, and he didn't even complete it in his lifetime. His children and grandchildren eventually completed this book, uh, The Compendium of Materia Medica. And he's been, uh, there's a comic book about him. And this movie still is from a 1956 uh, biographical movie made about him. And the Huntington has... Um, we don't have an original copy, but we have a really beautiful and complete facsimile of all, I think there are 27 volumes of this book. And this is one of the um, main sources behind the Chinese medicinal garden that we're going to be opening in next spring. 
So aside from medicinal gardens, so herbals were quite popular um, because they recorded the medicinal uses of things. I mean, it's sort of hard to remember back to, you know, there was a time period in human history where you couldn't just pop over to Walgreens and buy a bottle of aspirin. It's like you had to actually know what plant it was who's, and what part of that plant you would need to eat to get rid of your headache. So um, medicinal gardens and pharmacists um, are, are always like this, like a lot of the botanists and a lot of the people I've talked about have uh, medicinal backgrounds or they were pharma pharmacists. Um, so that's one sort of uh, garden in a book. Uh, this is uh, the Hortus Eistetensis is the garden of Eichstatt. Um, so back in the day, there was sort of a wavery line between church and state. And so uh, the the uh, Prince Bishop of Eichstatt, which is a town in Bavaria, um, and this is his his uh, sort of, uh, not a pa palace, maybe a um, sort of a fortress on the hill. Uh, he was very wealthy and he had this elaborate garden that had many, many um, tiers. And it was legendary. It was the first botanical garden um, in Germany, and it was one of the first botanical gardens outside of Italy. And um, so he enlisted the, he basically commissioned Basilius Bessler, who was a pharmacist, um, to create uh, basically an album of all the plants in his collections. And that's me grinning like a fool because I actually got to see part of the garden. Um, the garden itself was destroyed by marauding Swedes um, in, in, the, in the 18th century, I think. And they never restored it to its original glory. Um, although in the 1990s, uh, they did use this book to try and uh, reconstruct parts of it. And so the, sort of the kitchen garden that's on the top level is what you can see. And that's where I am looking out that. Um, arched window. So Bessler, and you'll notice that when we get into the world of botanical illustration, everybody's always um, depicted, you know, sort of brandishing their favorite plant. Um, and these are two examples of the illustrations in the book. Um, they are exquisite. It took him 16 years and an entire workshop of artisans um, uh, artists and printmakers to actually complete this book. And it wasn't published until after he died. Um, and the interesting thing about the copy that we have at the Huntington, which are these black and white images, um, there were two editions made. There was a fancy hand colored edition, which is really lovely. Um, I have a facsimile of that because I'm a giant book nerd. And um, and it's beautiful and it's all hand colored. And that facsimile was reproduced from the copy that lives in the library at the University of Eichstatt. But the first edition was not hand colored. Um, and what I found, uh, what I found touching about this, looking at it in the reading room is if you look at the upper right hand corners of all these pages, they're, they're all worn the upper right hand corners because this book was actually used. People used it to look up plants and to, to look up the names of the plants and to, um, to find out where they were. It was, it was really amazing. And this first edition also had a lot of narrative about the garden itself that was omitted from the fancy color version that came out later. Um, so, and of course, what's interesting is here is this relatively small town um, in Bavaria, and in amongst the Prince Bishop's collection were Aloe Americana, which is actually agave. Um, pretty much anything that was like, that looked like an aloe, and they didn't know what it was, was called aloe. But this is an agave and a mellow cactus and an aloe. So, you know, plants from around the world were all making their way to this um, small town in, in Bavaria. Because if you had enough money, you could get almost anything. So uh, Carl Linnaeus, um, I don't, uh, again, if we were in person, I would, I would, you know, ask for a rousing show of hands about how many people know Carl Linnaeus. Um, he was a Swedish doctor and botanist, and he famously came up with the taxonomic system that we actually still use today. Um, it's, it's kind of been revised because now we know more about microbes and bacteria than they did back then. Back in his day, it was sort of the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. And it went kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And um, the order, um, he came up with a way of grouping plants based on their based on their genitalia, which meant that he was actually um, uh, there was a lot of actually controversy about this because people people actually didn't believe that plants reproduce sexually. They didn't believe that plants had sex. And so talking about the sex organs of plants just seemed totally outlandish. But um, his system was that the larger grouping would be the order 
which was determined by the number of female by the by the stigma is the number and then the um the genus was determined by order or class anyway it was determined by the number of stamens and this illustration that you see with all the little plant sex parts maybe you shouldn't look um was actually made by none other than Georg Eret, if you look at the little signature in the bottom right. So this is um, Carl Linnaeus's Systema Nature, Nature, which was the you know epic that that publishing his um, taxonomic system, and um, he was uh, very uh, you know well known. He was actually he became the reason he had so many different names is because he was originally Carl Linnaeus, and then he, once he became um, sort of uh, um, what do you call it? Not knighted, but um, he was made ennobled. He became Carl von Linné, um, and so he was he was pretty well known. As was Georg Eret. So enter George Clifford, who uh, was the grandson of a British banker who moved to the Netherlands. Now, um, at this time in history, uh, the it, the big the biggest companies around and and um, the, were the Dutch East India Company the Hudson Bay Company and the Royal African Company. And these were companies who basically were trade companies. They controlled trade routes. Okay. So this was a turbulent century. Um, the 18th century, you know, you look at 1737 within a few decades, the American revolution and the French revolution would happen. And there was just all this, um, not just exploration, but, but exploitation of resources in other parts of the world. This was when the slave trade really um, stepped up. Um, it was just a, a, it was like a very, very turbulent time. And these companies all made out like bandits. Um, I found several um, economic journals with articles about the Dutch East India Company. And in today's money, the Dutch East India Company would be worth about 8 billion with a B dollars. And um, George Clifford was one of the directors. So this was a guy with a lot of money. Um, and instead of collecting, you know, electric cars or, you know, collecting homes around the country, he had one estate in Holland, um, which still exists. It's now a college campus with some of the plants that he had, but, um, he had a fantastic plant collection. And I like to think that the the tiny bright spot in this otherwise turbulent and unpleasant era was that um, these trade routes also meant that plants traveled back and forth. And so I can't even imagine suddenly being aware of this entire continent of plants that you'd never heard of before. And he had a lot of them in his collection and he wanted them organized. So who did he hire? Carl Linnaeus. And, um, and he also hired Georg Eret and another artist, um, Jan Wendelar, to create illustrations um, for this book, uh, Hortus Cliffordianus, which is Clifford's Garden. And if you look at this frontispiece, and the frontispiece was um, uh, in, in early printed books, it was uh, kind of like an illustration at the opening of the book, and they were often highly allegorical. So if you look at this image closely, you know, there are, it, it's clearly like this figure in the middle is bringing, which was probably the, the king is bringing order to, you know, the indigenous people who don't need it around the world and animals and plants and and in the very back, looming over it all, is this bust of, of George Clifford. And the figure to his right, or to his left, who is beaming with light, is the god Apollo, as personified by Carl Linnaeus, bringing light to the world. And um, the the snake um, around Hortus Cliffordianus is the Ouroboros, which was the symbol of infinity that we used before the figure eight. So basically, this is uh, Clifford's garden forever, is what it's saying. Um, but this book is really, again, just exquisite. Um, you know, the illustrations are lovely. This image on the right is actually from one of the, um, it's one of the herbarium specimens from Clifford's estate. Um, the the detail is just lovely. And these are, you know, some of the plants that we actually have at the Huntington and I, um, with matching photos of, of the plants today. Um, another, another treasure is, um, uh, Curtis's Botanical Magazine, which you may or may not know, it's it's the oldest um, continuously publishing uh, botanical magazine in the world. It's published by the Royal Botanic Gardens Q. And over the um, centuries that it's been in existence, many of the world's greatest uh, botanical illustrators have contributed work. And this lovely Welwitchia, having a little, let's bring, in, bring things around here. 
Um, this lovely Wawichia, um, which shows you the female plant and the male plant together uh, by Walter Hood Fitch um, is, is one of the many illustrations. Actually, and you can you can order this for your very own living room from the Huntington store. Um, not that I'm here to plug that, but um, anyway, we have two complete, uh, one complete set with all the volumes of Curtis's Botanical Magazine, and then one almost complete that's missing a few volumes. Um, but again, the, the idea of capturing capturing the world of plants in a single book or in a in a series of magazines. And I'm gonna I'm kind of wrapping up now. So this was my. This was my favorite book um, of all the many weird uh, and interesting plant books and plant information that I discovered in the library. Um, this is a book by Erasmus Darwin, who, yes, was the grandfather of Charles Darwin. Um, it's a two volume, it's two volumes in one. Um, the, the, together they're called the Botanic Garden. The first part is called The Economy of Vegetation. The second part is called The Loves of the Plants. So the economy of vegetation is kind of archaic language. And what, what he was talking about is natural processes, um, the natural processes that influence plants. And so he was talking a lot about geology and, and weather patterns and, and that kind of thing. And the second part of this is this epic poem that is basically a mnemonic device to teach people Carl Linnaeus's sexual system for categorizing plants. And it is amazing. He was a really interesting person. He was an abolitionist. He um, supported the education of girls and women. And he also um, was a, he was a devout believer in, in sharing science with lay people. Cause a lot of the books that I've shown you were all in Latin, you know? So it was, for me, it was, it was hilarious going through them because I would be like, I don't read Latin. So it would be, be like, blah, 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 salvia. Blah, you know, blah, 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 Pinus, blah, blah, you know, I, all I recognize were the Latin uh, plant names. And so this entire book is in English and it's written in this amazing style that I find immensely readable even today. Um, and it opens with this little dedication to um, the Swedish sage who is Carl Linnaeus um, and is botanic muse who in this latter age led by your airy hand, the Swedish sage bade his keen eye your secret haunts explore on dewy dell, high wood, and winding shore. Say on each leaf how tiny graces dwell, how laugh the pleasures in a blossom's bell, how insect gloves arrive, arise on cobweb wings, aim their light shafts, and point their little wings. I mean, the whole book is just delightful. Um, you can see the verse up here where he where he would sort of, you know, it was sort of like love poems from a plant's perspective. And then the footnotes at the bottom would be sort of descriptions of the plant. And, and you know, um, it's the nature of this plant. And as you can see um, in this beautiful illustration by um, yet another great name, Frederick Polydor Nodder, who was the uh, botanical illustrator to the queen or the king at that time. Um, this beautiful illustration is accompanied by footnotes. And it's interesting when I was reading it because at that time they didn't know that the traps actually digested the insects. And so when you read the little narrative, um, you know, he describes them as these, these um, defensive armaments. And, and so apparently what they thought was they were traps that were designed to trap, to catch insects and kill them to protect the flowers. Um, so anyway, the, the book is gorgeous. Everything, the marbled edges, the marbled end papers, the binding, everything was just lovely. I could have stayed all day in the library with this book. Um, and then the real treat was that our edition. So I, I also bought a facsimile of, of this book, which, you know, working at the Huntington has been very dangerous because I used to spend a lot of my money on shoes and now I spend all my money on facsimile books. Um, but the facsimile book that I bought was made from a copy that lives at the University of Edinburgh. And it does not have these illustrations. These two plates were engravings made by none other than William Blake. Um, and the drawings um, the, the, and the actual drawings were made by Henry Fuseli, the amazing Swiss um, artist who made lots of uh, really trippy, strange and very goth um, illustrations. So um, I actually found online a place that made reproductions of the tornado because I just love the tornado image so much. And going back to our dis earlier discussions of flooding rivers and floodplains, this image on the left is sort of an anthropomorphic um, an anthropomorphic image of the fertilization of Egypt. So if you look beyond the figure that's standing in the front, 
um, you see the old man kind of looming over. And that is, I think, the personified Nile, because the Nile would also flood and, and ebb and flow and also um, leave behind a lot of fertile um, fertile silt. And so hence the fertilization of Egypt. But um, so if I have piqued your interest in anything, um, these are the blogs that led to this, <laughs> that led to this presentation. Um, they are in order about oranges, the history of citrus. Um, Love Botanical Style is about uh, Erasmus Darwin's book. A Gasteria by Any Other Name is about Georg Eret. Uh, Titanic Mysteries is about the Titan Aram and features some illustrations from Curtis's Botanical Magazine. Um, the Hass Avocado article um, is actually a frontier story. Um, and Bee Mine is about bee orchids, which is just uh, a sassy story about uh, orchids fooling insects into being their go-betweens. So if you want to write these down, or if you want to snap, a, do a screenshot or take a picture with your phone, um, if not, you can also go to the Huntington website and just search on, uh, search for Verso and my name and a lot of these will come up. So uh, in conclusion, I just want to say, um, you know, the, the thing that's really wonderful about these books is that, you know, you wander around the gardens and you look at these plants and, you know, you feel that ooh factor when you see something cool or so, you feel your heart racing when you look at an interesting plant. And then I go into the library and I look at these books and I can't tell you what a trip it was to like, look at that Darwin book and you're looking across like, you know, 300 years and you're somehow connecting with somebody because you know, you both had that heart racing about a plant. And so this picture, the little black and white picture is Adrian Hardy Hayworth, who is the namesake of the genus Hayworthia. Um, he didn't name it, his, his botanist friend Henri Duval named it in his honor. Um, but he's, he's brandishing his favorite plant, which is the epiphyllum that he described to European science. And the beatific expression on his face, you may see echoed in the beatific expression on my face in this photo, which is the first time I saw a Welwitchia in person. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope you're all still awake and engaged. And um, I hope there's time for questions because I wasn't looking at the clock. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat or you can put them in the Q&A below. Should I open this up? We have a question. Do you know how often the World Plant Police meet to change the names? <laughs> um. You know, the world plant police are pervasive. They are everywhere all the time working to disrupt your knowledge of plant taxonomy. Um, no, I don't know how often the world police meet, but um, I did at I did at the um, uh, the last, not the last uh, succulent plant symposium at the Huntington, but the one last year, there was actually somebody from Q who actually explained the genetic studies that led to the breaking up of aloe into three different uh, genera now. And I'm still annoyed by it, um, but it was helpful to understand why they felt that that needed to be done. And yes, thank you. Zauschneria forever, Laura. Zauschneria forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another question. Um, could we access the library book collections by visiting the Huntington? Well, here's the thing. The Huntington used to be super restrictive and we're still battling this, this impression that we are super restrictive. Um, you used to have to have an, a, like a university affiliation to get into the, certainly the rare books. Um, and now we, in the past couple of years, it's been changed. So you only need to be 18 years of, of age but you also have to be um, sort of using a, uh, you need to be, uh, need to look at the materials for a legitimate research uh, project. So it's not like you could order them up. And I have to confess, I'm, I'm honest, I, I exploit the fact that I work there all the time. It's like, I actually went to look up these books and I kept finding interesting books. And then I was like, okay, how can I write a blog about this? Um, so I, my dream is at some point, I, I hope that we can have some sort of an exhibition where you'd be able to see these books um, and to enjoy them because they really are something. Although, um, you know, the other thing is almost all of the books that in, in my presentation tonight have been digitized. And so um, 
there are all these great projects like Project Gutenberg and a lot of them you can you can actually and you can look at all the illustrations you can page through them online so there are like a lot of digital uh, copies out there. Do we have any other questions? Do you know if there are still no. current compendiums out there? Oh, um, you know, the Western Garden books still exist. I mean, there actually was a recent edition out. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I have to admit, I'm kind of addicted to the San Marcos website because I, I look at that all the time to read uh, plant information. And I know I know digitization has kind of kind of destroyed the, um, you know, the, the bookiness, but there are a lot of... Um, there are still a lot of, um, you know, sort of compendiums out there. Are there any other questions or comments? There is another one. Can you talk a little bit about how the Huntington keeps track of their current plant collection? Oh my goodness. You know, I was at a, um, I was volunteering at a cactus and succulent uh, show and sale. And I was, you know, in the break area and I overheard these two people talking and I heard Huntington. So my ears pricked up and one person was saying, yeah, you know, I don't think that they're that interested in promoting the gardens anymore because there's not that much going on. And I just was, I, you couldn't, I was like, what? So I had to jump in on that and say, um, you know, um, so every plant at the Huntington has been accession. So just like all the books in the library and all the pieces of art in the art collections, there are accession records for all the plants. Uh, we have accession records that actually go all the way back to William Hertridge, who was the first direct, the first um, grounds, uh, the first ground superintendent under Henry Huntington. So there are ages and ages of records. And in many ways, they are more organized than some of the library collections, which have really strange and, and, not very um, uh, uniform card catalog systems. So um, there are accessions and I mean, people are always amazed, but you know, like every plant in the parking lot, when you park there and there are all the lovely plants, like all of those are accessioned, everything has been accessioned. And um, we do have a curator, Kathy Musial, former board member was, uh, is the curator of living collections. And so she sort of oversees that. Oh, um, thank we, you. We do have another question. Does the Huntington have the Martin de la Cruz and Juan Bandiano book? No, but we have the beautiful 1940, um, uh, the beautiful 1940 Johns Hopkins University Press um, facsimile of it because the that book is actually a manuscript, which means it's a handwritten book. And so there's only one, um, but that, that uh, facsimile is really lovely. And I know that we do have that in the collection, although it's also considered a rare book because it, um, it, there weren't, there aren't very, very many copies left. You can also, if you search for that Amazon, <laughs> actually on Amazon, you can find, um, you know, sort of less opulent reproductions. If you're really interested in just seeing the images and, and some of the text. Um, they're not as nice as the facsimile, but, you know, just to get the content, you can find it on Amazon. Um, someone is asking, where would you find the facsimiles that you're recommending? Ah, well, so um, I spent a lot of time in a lot of rabbit holes. There are different publishers make facsimiles. So Tashen, T-A-S-C-H-E-N. Tashin makes a lot of facsimile books and I've, I own a lot of different Tashin books. Tashin actually made a facsimile of the Anna Atkins British algae books. Um, they also made a book, uh, a facsimile of the Das Neue Kreuter book, which is another, um, like a German uh, herbal from about I think it's like a 15th century German herbal. So Tashin books makes a lot of interesting facsimiles. Um, and uh, I go, I shop a lot at Abe used books, um, used books, you know, sort of collector books or antiquarian books. A lot of times you can find the facsimiles there. And here's the sad thing. When I was looking for, I was looking for a copy of the Nehemiah Gru book. And um, I, so I went to Abe used books and there they had a copy of it and it was a, an original, you know, an original copy. Uh, and it was selling for about $24,000. And then right below it was the facsimile, which was only 350. <laughs> so, the, you know, so it, it becomes like a whole thing unto itself is collecting the facsimiles because so many of these books are clearly out of my, out of my price range. So. 
Thank you so much, Sandy. That was absolutely incredible.